Why don't we get started with the housekeeping and then we'll do the roll and I think okay. you're going to lead us yes. through that, right? I can Great. start. Um, Perfect. Thank you. Welcome committee members, liaisons, and members of the public to the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission Eligibility and Budget Review Committee meeting. Thank you for joining us. We will begin at 12.03 p.m. We are using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please use the raised hand feature. To use the raised hand feature by phone, dial star nine on your phone style pad to raise your hand and do the same to lower your hand. Please utilize this tool to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. All LSTFC and committee meetings will be recorded and posted to the State Bar website. A friendly reminder that this is a video conference and to please be aware of your surroundings behind you. Zoom captioning is available. To enable, select live transcript at the bottom of your Zoom screen, then select enable auto transcription. A few troubleshooting tips. For those using Zoom on a computer, when on mute, holding down the space bar will temporarily unmute. If you use your phone to dial into this meeting, please be sure your computer's microphone is on mute to avoid audio feedback issues. While joining audio via computer is highly recommended, if an individual loses audio, they can call in separately using the Zoom conference number. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, and I think we're next going to do um, roll calls. So Erica, are you doing that? Yes. Or, yeah. Perfect. Um, Blakemore? Here. Akwagi? Mm -hmm. uh, Fightmaster? Here. King? Here. Klein? Meeker? And Vargas? Here. Right. Um, and then I'll go through advisors and liaisons. Um, Judge Seligman? Here. Um, our uh, Laura Brown? Here. Melanie Snyder? Lauren Klein? Here. And Zach Newman? Here. Right. Um, and then State Bar staff. Um, I see that Colleen is here and Rocio is here. Uh, Thank you. Terrific. Um, I know we received um, some letters, I think, that were circulated from programs. So all of you should have received those. And I don't know if there is there anyone else here now that wishes to make a public comment? Uh, hold on a second. There's one person. I'll let them, allow them to talk. OK, thank you, Kimberly. Catherine, I just want to note that there are should be some folks some member programs coming. Um, some might just come for their agenda item, but okay. hopefully well, some are here. Do, sure. So we can do um we can ask again before the agenda items. Not Great. not a problem. Thanks for letting me know, Zach. Um is that Aaron Scott? <laughs> yes. Hi. Um <clears throat> Sorry, this is Erin Scott. I'm the executive director of the Family Violence Law Center in Oakland. Um, and we are one of the organizations that um, is uh, on the agenda today because we have consistently fallen below the 75% uh, for the eligibility piece of the application to be funded uh, through the state bar. Um, and I just wanted to say a few words in support of the State Bar's recommendation that we continue to receive funding. Um, part of the reason that we keep falling below 75% is that we employ a holistic model um, that provides 24-hour crisis assistance, case management. Um, you know, we, we do a whole range of different types of things to support survivors, the majority of which actually um, often happens in concert with their legal services and um, both addresses their needs more holistically, which, uh, we, you know, we rarely have someone come in who just has a legal services need, but we've also found that doing it this way makes it more likely that the um, client is going to be able to go through with the legal process. Um, you know, if they're they're trying to get a restraining order, or a family court order, or deal with a housing issue, and they don't have enough food to eat, you know, it's they're not going to be very successful. So, 
uh, we really um, address the legal services in a whole person um, type of way. The only other thing I just did want to say is that in the State Bar's report, and I've, I've talked with State Bar staff about this, it, it says that um, we're the only organization in Alameda County to provide free representation in family law and domestic violence cases. And um, what it actually says in our application and, and what's um, actually accurate is that uh, it's us in Bay Area Legal Aid um, <clears throat> who provide those services. We are the only domestic violence agency um, that has a team of lawyers that provide services in the holistic way that we do. Um, and in terms of us and Bay Legal, we obviously um, partner very closely and a lot of uh, what, what happens is with their small staff, they're doing, generally speaking, more intense family law cases. And we are doing um, you know, close to a thousand uh, largely restraining order cases. So you know, we're, we're sort of a, a team that works in concert, but I just wanted to clarify that point um, just to make sure you have accurate information. Um, and I'll be available during the um, agenda item if anyone has questions. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for being here and making a, a public comment. We appreciate that. It, there's um two more people. I'll let the next person talk. Okay. Oh, hello. My name is Greg Armstrong. I'm the Deputy Director of Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino. Uh, my Executive Director, Pablo Ramirez, uh, regrets that he couldn't be here. He had a pre-scheduled uh, vacation period. Um, I uh, We understand from the uh, State Bar that they have changed their position on recommending, uh, or, or rather not recommending the uh, funding for us, and they are now recommending it, and we appreciate that. Uh, and we wanted to uh, make a, a public statement that, um, uh, you know, LASSB's mission and vision has always been to be a pro bono uh, oriented uh, organization. In 1958, an inspired group of compassionate attorneys founded LASSB with the purpose of providing low income families uh, who couldn't afford legal representation, the assistance that they needed. LASSB's mission was to establish a small legal aid office that would coordinate efforts for volunteer attorneys to help poor uh, residents and senior citizens. Um, it has always been a volunteer program, but in the last three years, LASSB has grown its staff to levels that have displaced its uh, pro bono hours. Nevertheless, the program is constantly working to increase its pro bono involvement with the local bar. Uh, the commitment to grow volunteer uh, involvement is deeply ingrained in LASSB's core mission. Uh, we have a pro bono team uh, that consists of four elements, our executive director, deputy director, pro bono coordinator, and staff attorneys. Our uh, executive director participates in pro bono events, bar uh, association gatherings, has joined committees, and uh, oversees our policies, and he's established a strong uh, reputation for pro bono engagement. He collaborates with community partners to involve new attorneys and larger firms. The deputy director works with volunteer attorneys, fellows, and interns who represent the next generation of attorneys. Uh, we develop uh, new initiatives with clinics that provide volunteer attorneys with opportunities to deliver necessary services. Our pro bono coordinator manages all of our volunteer attorneys. She tracks vol uh, pro bono hours, um, assigns cases, ensures compliance, and provides support. Uh, when challenges arise, it ensures the highest quality of services through accurate information and assistance. And finally, we have a, a two-person team of litigators who go out into the community uh, to core community hubs uh, to give presentations about LASSB services, but they can also present at bar associations, law firms, and other legal events to promote pro bono involvement. Uh, it's true that in 2022, we faced some challenges recruiting pro bono attorneys due to the changing legal marketplace, uh, but most importantly, LASSB's percentage of volunteer time was diluted by the hiring of new staff, but that staff increase was necessary uh, for LASSB to expand its operation. Uh, despite that challenge, in 2022, our pro bono attorneys positively impacted over 1,400 uh, client and family members. 
Uh, we view LASSB's 2022 expansion as an investment in the growth of our pro bono vision. Uh, we have enhanced our services with cutting edge techniques and technologies, including the use of AI to improve efficiency and effectiveness and professionalism. Uh, some examples of our new pro bono opportunities include a new DV clinic in Riverside's Family Court, our partnership with New Beginnings United Methodist Church, which is providing us office space for more virtual and on-site clinics in downtown San Bernardino. We have new veterans clinics, expungement clinics, UD clinics, and uh, have expanded our guardianship clinics. Uh, we, are, we believe that we are now positioned to leverage uh, from our new from our new position, uh, a campaign really to increase pro bono participation in the IE. Uh, we believe that LASSB will be a leader in that campaign and in the IE and will ultimately be a statewide example of innovative pro bono development. This is part of our strategic vision, and uh, we want to meet the increasing needs of our marginalized residents in the IE. Uh, we have an unwavering, our commitment to pro bono is unwavering, and we are committed to developing services that will always uh, have pro bono as the cornerstone of our operations. So we look forward to working with the bar and expanding our uh, pro bono opportunities and, and uh, you know, eventually becoming a leader in pro bono in Southern California. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your um, comments. And I think we all received um, the, the letter from your executive director um, as well. So thanks. Thank you. Okay, Kimberly, did you say there was one more? It's actually three. Let me um, let the next person talk. Okay. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Levine, and I'm the pro bono director at Vetsetic Legal Services. We are also on the agenda today, and on behalf of our president and executive director, Diego Cartagena, and our entire agency, I would like to express our gratitude for the tentative approval of Vet FedEx request. Um, our organization's roots are as a volunteer-led agency, and pro bono is really a vital and meaningful part of all the work that Vet FedEx does. As an agency, we're really proud to make pro bono front and center of all that we do, and we appreciate the opportunity to continue to undertake these efforts. We have a full team at that FedEx dedicated to overseeing our pro bono and volunteer engagement. Every day, our agency is on the front line serving clients with pressing legal needs, and our dedicated clinics and outreach coordinator manages a robust portfolio of pro bono clinics that bring in private bar attorneys to help address the justice gap. Some of these clinics and programs, in fact, are delivered almost entirely by volunteers several times a month, every month of the year. In just one week recently, for example, we held three separate large-scale pro bono clinics, one dedicated to legal name and gender marker changes on behalf of our transgender and non-binary clients, one dedicated to self-help conservatorship filings, and another focused on working with undocumented foster youth who needed to file employment authorization applications so that they could access a range of benefits and social services. The pro bono allocation also enables us to work with a truly robust network of law firm and in-house attorneys on individual case placements across all our practice areas. Just last year, we worked with over 830 volunteer attorneys on our cases and our clinics, and we're so thankful for the support to be able to continue to do so. In addition, a separate dedicated volunteer coordinator on our team oversees our large in-house volunteer program. She also manages our year-round internship program and helps coordinate a pipeline to all our legal teams and our intake department. This summer, we're proud to work with over 40 talented law clerks and summer interns across all our legal practice areas as part of our Summer for Justice program. So pro bono really is the most significant and vital part of how we deliver our services. And the pro bono allocation really helps make all this reality. Thank you all again so much for the support. Thank you, uh, Sarah, for joining and for your comments. We're ready for the next one, Kimberly. Okay. Welcome, Andrea. Hi, my name is Andrea Siask, and I'm the grants manager at Veterans Legal Institute. 
And um, on behalf of our executive staff and staff and volunteers, um, we are most grateful for your consideration and recommendation for continued funding. Um, I'm the grants person, and so um, my comments will be um, fairly numerical. And so um, we are making gains in our pro bono attorney numbers. 2020, they were 2021, they were 239. I'm sorry, Andrea, you're breaking, up, you're breaking up a little bit. Oh, so sorry. Better? It is, um, yeah. Incrementally, we've made gains. Um, and, and of course, COVID has been a factor. Um, during that time, we've been investing in staff. And staff has been investing in mentoring and training and mentoring um, pro bono cases in, in much more complex legal areas, like the PACT Act legislation and, and what that's caused. And so um, in addition, you know, to this sort of internal um, turn, we have added three new positions. We have a grants manager, a deputy executive director, and now a director of operations. And so um, we are streamlining all processes and, um, Hope to continue working with you in the future. Um, and I just would like to say in terms of the future that training law students creates a ripple effect um, in terms of pro bono dedication in the future, which we count on. Um, so we are looking forward. We are also expanding our provision of services statewide, thanks to two new grants from the bar. Um, we are now in Northern rural California and Southern rural California regions, um, which are notoriously more difficult places to reach veterans. Um, and so we're expanding at the same time, we are strengthening our infrastructure and um, just hope for more positive results in the future. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate your comment. Last one. Um, Erin has her hand raised, but it's not turning on her microphone. Oh, I think she spoke before anyway, I think, right? Mm -hmm. So I think yeah, we... I'm I sorry. Think just... Yeah, I just didn't lower my hand. My apologies. No, no problem. One more person um, raised their hand, Catherine. Okay. Looks like Cynthia. Welcome. Hi, hi, hi everyone. Um, my name is Cynthia Chagoya, and I am the Chief Program Officer at the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. Um, I'm here to speak uh, with respect to agenda item 5.4, and that is uh, the recommendation that the Law Foundation be denied the pro bono allocation. Um, you know, I understand our pro bono hour, hours fell short of expectations. Um, you know, I'll, I'll note up front that um, as, as was said in the recommendation, our pro, pro no bono hours were about one fifth of our overall paid staff attorney hours. Um, and in terms of the ratio, we worked with three pro bono volunteer attorneys for every one paid staff attorney position. Um, my comments today are just to provide some further insight into the nature of our work and why the data provided doesn't fully capture the substantial effort of our pro bono team. Um, and that is, uh, well, first and foremost, pro bono is one of our core, core programs. Um, and, and with respect to our other programs, we also have a housing program, a health program, and a children and youth program. With respect to our health program and children and youth program, there are about a total of 20 attorneys out of the total 57 attorneys that we employ um, that work on matters or cases where they are direct court appointments. These are staff attorneys who work on cases uh, with very vulnerable individuals who cannot be referred to pro bono attorneys. So for example, um, these kinds of cases are cases where staff will represent children in custody disputes, family law cases, 
juvenile dependency, probate, um, guardianship matters. And as you may know, these cases often take a long time to process through the court. Um, it's not uncommon for us to have one of these clients um, on, on retainer for you know, five to 10 years given the court appointment. And again, these are not matters that would be appropriate to, to refer out to pro bono. Um, and, and with respect to these cases, you know, one of the priority is providing continued, uh, you know, the continued and, and consistency for the client and that if their case is going to be open for years, we want to, we want to do our best to make sure they work with one consistent attorney. Um, additionally, there is the rapid evolving nature of these individual cases. Um, many of these cases include a high volume of work that fluctuates greatly. And again, changing an, attor an attorney or uh, parsing it out into, into individual assignments just usually isn't the, the right fit for the nature of the representation. Um, and also I will add with respect to our health team, um, we represent nearly 4,000 clients a year who um, need representation with respect to um, where they have been placed on a medical hold for more than 72 hours and are entitled certain due process rights. Those cases also move really, really fast and also do not lend themselves to pro bono um, representation. Um, but again, I, I just wanted to provide that context because I, I think it does provide color to the nature of our work and perhaps uh, give some insight on why merely looking out the total number of pro bono hours in comparison with our total number of staffing hours, I think doesn't really paint a, a complete picture of the, the substantial nature of our pro bono effort. But um, thank, thank the, thank, also thank you for your time. Um, pro bono is a priority and, and this is something that will continue to grow and happy to hear um, any any suggestions or feedback you all have for our application in the future. Thank you. Thank you for joining. All right, I think that was the last public comment. Yes, Kimberly? Yes. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, no, sorry, somebody else has raised their hand. Well, Cynthia has her hand. Oh, there's somebody else, I see. Okay, I can't, act. my eyesight is getting worse, so welcome. I can't actually read your name, so we're going to let you speak. And introduce yourself. Um, hi, um, my name is Thais Fornere. I'm um, with WorkSafe, and um, I um, wanted to express my appreciation for um, your recommendation to approve uh, WorkSafe's um, carryover request. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your comment. Okay. Anyone else? And we we can check in again before we get to the agenda items. If there's somebody that's new that hasn't had a chance to speak, so. Okay. I think that takes us to approving the minutes from the June meeting. They were um, posted. Does. Anyone have any comments? And I neglected to welcome uh, Jim Meeker, who's uh, joined us. So glad that you could join us today. Yeah, having some tech technical difficulties. But I have one question on the minutes. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, I think on approval of the prior minutes, I'm listed as absent. I was attending that meeting, and I you had me down on voting on all the other issues. I don't know why I was listed as absent. Um. I would have to look at the recording, but it may have, were you potentially a few minutes late to that meeting? I, I think that he had tech problems joining the meeting, I think. And so it might have been a, when we took the initial role wasn't noted as being. Okay. So, so Erica, the process would be that you're gonna, you're gonna confirm that and we'll adjust the minutes um, accordingly, right? Uh, yes, I, could, I can do that. Or alternatively, if you would like me to just confirm that at the next meeting, we can approve the minutes at the next meeting. Do you, do, do you have a preference? No. Okay, I, I'm because his names reflected other places in the in the minutes for the 
right? Is, is what Jim was saying. Then mm -hmm. let's ap approve them. And if there's some glitch with that, you'll come back and let us know about that. Yes. Okay, so is there a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move. Jim moves. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Angie. Um, okay, any other discussion or questions? Okay, let's do the roll. McCloggy? Uh, Fightmaster? Approve. King? Approve. Klein? Maker? Yes. Vargas? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, I think we're into the substance of the of the meeting, um, and we're going to start with some updates from Rocio. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, so just a brief update to keep the, the committee apprised um, about Loyola Marymount University's 2023 IOLTA and EAF grant allocation. Um, we This was one of our very last monitoring visits of the year in 2022. And there was a finding um, about whether they had deducted for all of their criminal legal services activities. Um, and in working and receiving their response earlier this year, and working with our staff, they agreed and provided <laughs> accurate deductions for some of the work that had not um, been deducted in their 2023 IOLTA and EAF application. So as a result of that, their actual allocation for this year's grants um, slightly deducted, adjusted down um, in the amount of RIOLTA, it's $3,980 and EAF um, $2,485. And so they've agreed to that. They've worked with our staff to make appropriate budget revisions. Um, given the, the, the smaller amount, it falls within the self-executing threshold and does not require staff or committee approval. And we will be able to make those adjustments in their upcoming um, Q4 payment or distribution. Um, and those funds will go towards um, LA County's distribution for 2024. So just wanted to, to keep the committee up to date on that and provide that update. See if there's any questions. So I, it's, it's Catherine, I just have one question because I, I don't actually remember what happens. So when, when grants are adjusted, the money goes back only to the county where it was originally assigned as opposed to being reallocated the next year on a statewide basis. Correct, it goes back to be reallocated within that county Okay. For next year. And that's something that we track, correct? Okay. Great. Thanks. And then just a really brief um, uh, follow up to the last, just to keep it, since this falls within IOLTA for this committee. Um, at the last commission meeting, sorry, not this very last one this week, the prior, the one before that, um, the commission did approve the 2024 IOLTA distribution and a two year spend down period and asked staff to explore. Um, increasing that over three or four year spend down period. And so as part of that exploration, our office will also be sending a survey to grantees just to get community feedback and ideas to brainstorm if there's anything else we can do, how we can best support um, grantees, any questions they have about that increased spend down. And knowing also that the commission hopes to have recommendations for spend down ideas um, later this year. So hoping to bring some of that feedback back. So just wanted to to let everyone know that as well. Thanks for the Thank thanks for the updates. Um, Judge Klein has also joined us in Los Angeles, so we want to welcome his Are participation. You, I did tell people I unfortunately was going to be late. You did tell people, and we right. noted that, but we wanted to welcome you. I'm glad you know. I'm glad All right, um, <laughs> my laptop is in my daughter's trunk. So, oh, well, <laughs> other than that, everything's great. Fabulous. Okay. Were there any other questions for uh, Rocio before we move ahead? I have a, a sort of a slightly off topic, but it, it about the allocation of the money by county. Um, and I guess it's because I'm new and I don't know and tell me where to look. How do you find out how much of the IOLTA and EAF funds are allocated to each county as a whole? That's a great question. Erica, do you want me to answer that? Do you want to, you know, you, you gave a rundown, I think an abbreviated one recently. Yeah, um, 
sorry, so the question is how, how funds are allocated on a bi-county basis? Is that... I know it's a population, it's a, is there a, way to, a chart or someplace, somebody could see how much each county is being allocated. Well, we run the numbers from the American Community Survey um, in terms of the poverty population by county. Um, we use 125% of the federal poverty level, so that's different than the income eligibility standards, um, but that is um, what's reflected in the statute. Um, so I suppose if you were to know what the total distribution is and you have the percentage by county, you could do <laughs> the calculation. Um, but um, it may not reflect the total amount per county because as Rocio was mentioning, sometimes we have funds from prior years that get rolled in. And so um, it, it might deviate a little bit from sort of the, the total just amount um, dedicated for the 2024 distribution. But so you take the, the census figure for population of under 125% mm -hmm. and divide that by, well, there's 58 counties, so I mean, mm -hmm. uh, so you, you do 58 yeah. different calculations. I mean, I'm, I know it's probably beyond the scope of what we're talking about. So I can, if you want to That's talk fine. separate, I'm just confused. No, I think she, it's a proportional she, amount. So you take the 58 counties and you have the poverty, the total poverty population in California, and then each county has its proportional share. So however many individuals of that total amount um, live in that county, so it's a purport like a pro rata calculation. And I guess the, the initial question, Erica, as I understood it was, does the state bar have a chart that shows the distribution of funds by counties using that formula um, that could be shared with um, Angie or other people on the committee? I think that was the actual request. Um, I don't know if we've done that before, but I I mean, I'm sure we you, have, you have to work from you, you obviously have some kind of data you're working from that. Mm -hmm. At least tell me where where to go look for what you're looking yeah. at. We don't sure. have one that I'm aware of readily available, but that's something that we can. We can okay. Oh, yeah. Perfect. So thank you. I think that's an interesting question just to see the statewide distribution amounts, which could be helpful. So whatever you end up having that maybe you could just circulate it to members of the committee. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, and Jim has a question. Yeah, just just on that comic, uh, comment, Erica, I mean, remember when we were talking about expanding eligibility to 200% and whether or not the funding formula should go to 200% and you gave me the data where I could do the calculation to show that if we did the f allocation at the 200%, it would significantly shift funding from the rural and rural uh, urban uh, counties to the urban rural and the urban counties. So. I, I don't know how you produce that data, but I mean, that was, that did it by county. Yeah, um, that was, um, we pulled the American Community Survey data. We did it sort of internally. So um, in order to have that demonstration at the time. So, um, you know, as Rocio mentioned, that's something we can reproduce again with current information. Um, yeah. And when you say current, do you use a census four year average? Um. I would need to double check with our fiscal team. I believe we do use the five-year average, yes. A five-year average, okay. Thank you for that. Um, and thanks for the updates. And I think next up on the um, agenda is action on WorkSafe's um, IOLTA EAF carry for request. We had a brief um, comment about that a few minutes ago. So Erica, do you, are you the one that's gonna cover that? Yes. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so our first agenda item is WorkSafe's 2022 carryover amounts for both IELTA and EAF. Um, just a brief recap, I think we've talked about this several meetings in a row, so I'm sure you're all familiar, but whenever a carryover is requested, um, according to our functional matrix, if it's less than 10% of the grant award, the grantee can do it without requiring any sort of external approvals. Um, if it's between 10 and 25, um, a percent of the grant award, staff could approve that. Anything over 25% would require um, commission review um, and approval. So in WorkSafe's case, um, they had 
uh, requested carryover for both their IOLTA and their EIF grants. And in the case of IOLTA, it was about an 11% carryover. Um, and in the case of EIF, it was 37%. Um, so um, the reason we're bringing both of them to you, even the 11%, which staff typically would have been able to approve is because the request had come in late. Um, so we are requesting that the committee look at both of these. Um, but, but basically what had happened was that the organization had submitted a timely budget revision at the end of the year um, and then had later added the carryover, but it was not immediately brought to staff's attention. And so now that we know about it, that's why we're bringing it to you. Um, but given, given the carryover amounts, you know, the 11% is very low. As I just mentioned, they would be allowed to carry over 10% of it anyway. Staff is recommending approval on that. And the 37% carryover for EIF, um, as you know, with 2022 was sort of a unique situation in it that it was the first time that a two-year budget was allowed for these funds, given the very large increase um, for that funding in that year. So um, in, in order to conform to the flexibility um, that was accorded to all other grantees, uh, we are recommending approval to allow them to spend this down over the remainder of the year, um, the carryover for EIF. So they would have through December 31st, 2023 to spend their EIF carryover. Um, in the case of IOLTA, uh, they, they should have spent that down by now. Um, we recently released our, our Q2 reports, or in this case, Q6. Um, for carryovers and um, after June 30th. And so they, they should have spent the IELTA by now. And if they haven't, then we would request um, anything that's remaining once they file that report to be returned to the state bar. So. Okay, thanks for the explanation. Um, can you take the slide down so I can actually <laughs> see people while we're seeing if people have questions about um, the explanation and the staff recommendation to approve both of those carryover requests. I'm doing a bad job of paying attention to the two of you here. It's like, a, like, I don't know how to just like tell me if you want to talk, I guess. Um, so focus on the Zoom screen. No worries. Okay. Um, I'm not hearing any uh, requests. So is there a motion to approve the staff recommendation to approve work safes? Um, uh, carry over requests for IOLTA and EAF. I'll move. Thank you, Angie. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Louise. I think she, her hand beat your voice. <laughs> um, okay, Erica, I think, can you uh, call roll? Yes. McCloggy, Fight Master. Yes. King? Yes. Klein? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Vargas? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Motion carries. Terrific. Okay, that's going to take us to um, the next item on our agenda, which um, is the um, I think actually you're going to update us, right, Erica, about any budget revision requests received thus far, but not, I think there aren't any yet, right? So, um, yes. So we had we had received a few budget revision requests already for 2023 funds. Um, at the time we put it on the agenda, we hadn't calculated the totals yet, so we weren't sure if it would require committee action. Um, my understanding is the only one that has required approval was East Bay Community Law Center, and they were. Um, at a 14% budget revision. So staff has approved um, their budget revision. And um, I think, you know, moving forward, this will probably be a, a standing agenda item given the discussions we've had about encouraging grantees to submit their budget revisions more timely rather than, than just at the end of the year. But um, that system and that encouragement seems to be working so far and we have started to receive requests already, so. Perfect. Okay, and then uh, the next item, which does require action, is um, the, the two organizations um, relative to their uh, meeting the primary purpose. And so Erica is going to uh, walk us through that. Thank you. Sure. Um, so hopefully you can all see my screen now. Um, 
just a little bit of background on um, primary purpose and function for grantee organizations. Um, it's a requirement under the IELTA statute that um, each type of grantee demonstrate their primary purpose and function. Um, and under the statute, a qualified legal services project would do that by showing their primary purpose is providing free civil legal services to indigent persons. Um, and if you were a support center, you would need to have a primary purpose and function of legal training, legal technical assistance, or advocacy support for civil legal uh, services without charge. Um, so the way that grantee organizations would demonstrate that, that they, they've met their primary purpose or demonstrated their primary purpose is through their expenditures, their corporate expenditures in the prior year, which is something that we look at during the application review process. So staff, when they look at an application, sees an organization's total corporate expenditures in the prior year. Um, and then we have a worksheet where the grantee would deduct or the applicant would deduct any amount of funds that went to non-qualifying services. So in the case of a qualified legal services project, if they are serving clients who would be considered over income based on the eligibility standards, um, if they're providing services that are not civil legal services, they need to calculate that and deduct it out. Um, and then we, we calculate how much of the expenditures that are left um, compared to their, their total corporate expenditures. And we get that percentage, um, the proportion that is considered quote unquote qualifying. So um, in both cases, um, organizations, if they have 75% or higher, uh, qualified expenditures, they're considered or presumed eligible. Um, if they fall below that 75% uh, mark, then they are permitted to provide a narrative explanation as to how they believe their organization has demonstrated its primary purpose and function under the statute. Um, and so that's what we're focusing on um, today is, is those organizations that fell below 75% and provided a narrative description about um, their work and how they meet primary purpose. So um, the first one is Centro Legal de la, de la Raza. Um, they have about a 62% primary purpose percentage at this point. Um, they're an organization that um, provides assistance with, with housing rights, workers' rights, and immigration services. Uh, they note that they do have a youth law academy um, they do sometimes serve over income clients or have a few fee for service cases. Um, and then really the main thing that, that brought down their primary purpose percentage that they highlighted was that they administer to emergency relief funds. So they're the administrator of those funds. Um, and um, one is a, a federal emergency rental assistance program. And the other is they're the administrator for a program called Alameda County Housing Secure. Uh, which is a collaborative of legal services providers that do both direct legal services as well as providing emergency rental assistance to low-income tenants. Um, and, and my understanding is that they've participated in that for, for some time now. Um, and, and, you know, there are other grantees as well that have, have this sort of um, combined approach of legal services as well as um, providing, rent, particularly in the housing context, rental assistance. Um, given the sort of the benefit, um, the often longer lasting benefit of a client who might be facing an eviction case, um, if they can avoid that altogether or find more financial stability in order to prevent a future eviction, um, they, they feel it's an important part of, of the work that they do. Um, they also noted that prior to, I believe this is only the second application cycle where they have fallen below 75%. Um, last year, they were at about 70%. And in 2022, for the 2022 grant year, they were at 76%. So um, this is only the second year where they have fallen below the presumption. Um, and in consideration of that, um, staff is recommending uh, that the committee find that they've demonstrated primary purpose um, as far as it pertains to the statute. Um, and then the, the second organization is Family Violence Law Center, which um, I know that we heard from Erin, their executive director. Um, so as she mentioned, they are an organization that provides holistic services in the area of domestic violence. Um, they do um, have some programs uh, related to you know, crisis intervention and youth leadership, as well as violence prevention um, as part of their total model. 
Um, but um, one thing that they had pointed out to staff as well is sort of the, the increased number of legal services clients that they have had over the years. It's been sort of a steady increase um, and even in their primary purpose percentage, uh, this is um, the highest that it's been in the past few application cycles. Uh, two years ago, it was around 65%. And so now they're up to 72, 73%. Um, and and they, they've gone into detail in the narrative that was provided to you about sort of their focus on, on, on legal services as well. Um, and, and so given, given their model, um, the benefit to their legal services clients, um, as well as the increasing focus on uh, providing services to, to legal service clients, um, staff is recommending approval for them as well. Um, and I did want to acknowledge um, the error in the memo. So I appreciate Erin pointing that out. Um, there are two legal service providers in Alameda County. Um, so they are not the only one, but they did note that they are um, a primary source of legal services for, for indigent clients needing family law. Okay, hey, thank you, um, Erica. Um, let's see, uh, anyone in LA have questions? Nope, good, okay. Can you just take the thing, thank you. Anybody else have questions about the recommendation? Okay, I, I think just just um, to clarify, like so primary purpose is one determination about whether you're eligible, but for services that are not legal services in that in the under the, the rule, those mm -hmm. services then get deducted from qualified expenditures. So this is simply are you eligible, but the services that aren't legal in nature, such as um, funding for housing assistance would be deducted from the application just for um, that. That's my understanding, which I think Erica is acknowledging. Yeah. Yes, so you're you um, would only be indicating if you vote to approve it that, that they've demonstrated their primary purpose, but anything that's considered non qualifying, they've already deducted it on the application and those expenditures are not going into the funding formula. So it's just whether despite the fact that they have these non qualifying expenditures, they would still be considered eligible for funding. Okay. Any, um, any other questions. And so what we need to do is make a motion to approve the staff recommendation, um, determining that uh, the two organizations, which is, maybe you put it back, I yeah, I'll put, I'll put motion. Yeah. So that the um, eligibility and budget review committee finds that Central Lake Al de la Raza and Family Violence Law Center have demonstrated their primary purpose and function of providing civil legal services to indigent persons without charge through the narrative explanation included in the 2024 IOLTA EAF applications. So is there someone that would like to make a motion to approve that recommendation? I will, I'll make that motion. Thank you, uh, Luis. Is there a second? Second? Thank you, Jim. Any other discussion or questions? Okay, not, not hearing any of those. Um, let's take a roll call and maybe we just move the slide down for the roll call. Thank you. Um, Akwagi? Fightmaster? Yes. King? Yes. Klein? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes. Meeker? Yes. Vargas? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. So that takes us on to our um, uh, the pro bono allocation under test C, which we heard a number of programs um, talk about uh, today. And so Erica is going to walk us through that information, and um, and then I think if if people have questions, obviously we'll we'll, we'll talk about it. But I think some of the um, applicants may still be on the phone if there's specific questions for them as well. So, um, hey Erica, thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, so the applications um, seeking pro bono allocation. Um, 
they're under the funding formula, there's 10% of the funding in each county that's set aside for qualified legal services projects that coordinate um, the recruitment of substantial numbers of attorneys um, and provide services through those pro bono attorneys as uh, their principal means of service delivery. Um, so that's traditionally been viewed as a two-part test. Um, we have our substantial numbers threshold. So um, in order for an organization to apply, they would need to demonstrate that in the county in which they're applying, they've recruited at a minimum 30 attorneys or 5% of the attorneys in the county or received a minimum of 1,000 donated legal service hours from uh, attorneys in the prior, um, in the prior year. And so since QLSPs can operate in multiple counties, they, they would need to do this for each county in which they wanna receive that additional allocation. Um, receiving the allocation also allows uh, these grantee organizations to use a different income standard, which in many, but not all counties is actually higher than the 200% of the federal poverty level. So, um, so that's sort of seen as the, the two main benefits of seeking the allocation is the additional funding as well as the ability to, to use a different income standard um, to serve more clients. So, um, so once an organization has demonstrated that they've passed the substantial numbers threshold, um, they also need to show that um, pro bono is their principal means of service delivery. Um, and so we have three, three sort of tests under the eligibility guidelines in order to demonstrate that. Um, they're referred to as tests A, B, and C. Test A is uh, very straightforward. It's just if you have more volunteer attorney legal service hours in the prior year than your staff attorney legal service hours, eligibility for this allocation is presumed uh, because you've shown that you know volunteers are essentially doing more of the work than, than the staff attorneys in terms of um, you know a quantitative analysis. Uh, test B is a little bit more expansive. <clears throat> in that it looks at more volunteer time than just attorneys. So um, the total volunteer time would need to exceed staff legal service hours. Um, and then of the volunteer time, more than half of it needs to come from volunteer attorneys. So there's still, still an emphasis on pro bono attorneys providing services, although it does incorporate um, paralegal hours as well. Um, and if an organization can demonstrate that they pass test B, Again, their, their eligibility is presumed for the allocation. Um, if not able to meet either of these quantitative tests, an organization can provide a narrative explanation, uh, which, is, uh, required, which requires committee and commission review. Um, and, and one thing I wanted to note about the substantial numbers threshold that I went over first is that that's really been considered a bright line rule. So if an organization can't meet those, those threshold numbers, they're assumed ineligible for, um, for the allocation. But if they do meet that, then that's when they would move on to these tests A, B, and C uh, to provide um, either their, their attorney numbers or their, their narrative explanation. Um, so for our pro bono applicants, um, this year for the 2024 allocation, we've received 19 um, applications to receive the pro bono allocation. Um, nine of the organizations meet either test A or B, um, and then we have 11 that fall under test C. Um, I put an asterisk there because we do have one organization that's applying in multiple counties and they, <clears throat> they qualify for the allocation in all of their counties under test A or B, except for one. So uh, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights falls under both these bullet points. They qualify in most of their counties and then for Sacramento County, we'll talk about their, their test C narrative. Um, so uh, just to, to give you a sense of the organizations that, that um, are presumed eligible for the allocation on uh, test A or B, we have those nine organizations listed here. Um, of those nine, you can see that, that seven of them qualify under test A, and then if you qualify under test A, you're going to meet test B most of the time, not always. Um, and then um, in, in two instances, they, um, they qualified under test B, B only. So um, this is just to give you a sense of the organizations that um, are presumed eligible. <clears throat> 
And then for test C applicants, we had attached their, their narratives to your, um, to your memo. And um, this is just to provide you a little more context as well about sort of the history of their, their pro bono allocations and the tests under which they've applied. Um, you can see that for many of them for the past few years, they've been applying under, under test C um, and not able to, to qualify under a quantitative test um, with a few exceptions. Um, we did recommend most of these organizations as eligible for the allocation. Um, in your memo, we had recommended Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino, Riverside Legal Aid, and Law Foundation of Silicon Valley as, as ineligible. Um, but uh, as you heard from Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino, as well as the public comment that you received from that organization, um, in consideration of the fact that they are a rural service provider that faces uh, more challenges than, than some organizations that have larger pools of attorneys, as well as law schools um, and other local resources that, um, you know, we do acknowledge that there are uh, more challenges to, to recruiting and sustaining pro bono services um, in more rural counties like le where Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino operates. Um, so in light of that, in consideration of that, um, we are recommending Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino as eligible for the allocation in San Bernardino County. Um, we're still not recommending them as eligible in Riverside uh, because they don't meet that substantial numbers threshold that I, that I went over before. Um, but they do meet it in San Bernardino. And so we're recommending them as eligible there. Um, and then given that it's a similar set of circumstances, we're recommending Riverside Legal Aid as eligible as well. Um, we are recommending Law Foundation of Silicon Valley as ineligible, um, given that they do not have a history of applying for the pro bono allocation or receiving the pro bono allocation. Um, so there's never been an instance that we're aware of, at least not in recent memory, where they've They've qualified under one of the quantitative tests um, and um, given their, their setting and the numbers that they provided, staff didn't feel that they had quite demonstrated that this is their principal means of service delivery. Um, and so um, we're still maintaining that recommendation with regard to, to that organization. But, um, but I know that you know, there's 11 organizations here and that there were a lot of pages to those narratives. So. I think if you wanna hear, I don't know if there are any grantees still on the call that you'd like to hear from, or if you have any questions about a particular organization, I'd be happy to answer those. Are there, um, Erica, you're done with your presentation, yeah. right? Yes. Okay. Um, so anybody in LA have questions? Not, no one here. Other people have questions? Judge Seligman. Yeah, I just was interested in what the actual numbers were for Law, Law Foundation for Silicon Valley. Yeah. Um, let's <clears throat> see. Sorry, I just need to bring that up again. So it looks- I think they had 179 volunteers working 57, 14 hours, is that right? Yeah. For attorneys. Correct, yeah. So they had noted that um, sort of their, the number of volunteer attorneys was about three, the ratio to their staff attorneys was about three and a half to one. Um, and as Catherine just stated, yeah, they had 179 volunteers and 5,700 volunteer attorney hours. Um, and they had a good amount of, um, they had 13 law students as well, which contributed an additional 3,000 hours. But um, but just looking at attorneys and paralegals, that was the 5,700 was the the amount. And I think I guess when I did the calculation, I think it's about 18 percent. There's the the rate that it's about 18 percent of the attorney services are provided by um, by volunteers. Yeah. Which I think to the point of like you know close to close to twenty percent of their services are provided by that. And I, yeah. I think I'm oh, sorry. The only other thing I just note is Silicon Valley is probably one of the 
two or three most uh, pro bono rich communities in, in terms of resources in California. I mean, in contrast to San Bernardino. Um, and if you get past San Francisco, maybe Silicon Valley is probably the second in the Northern California that I'm aware of in terms of the capacity for generating pro bono support. Erica, are there other pro bono programs that are getting pro bono allocations in? And the Silicon Valley, Santa Clara County area? Yes. Um, let's see. Probably San Mateo, huh? Um, or you, you will know better than I. I. I still think of myself as an Angelino, so mm -hmm. I, I can tell you the counties here, but not as well in that area. Um, so Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, um, even though they're on the list for Tessie for Sacramento, they did meet tests A and B in Santa Clara and San Mateo counties, um, as well as San Francisco. So they, they receive it there. Um, and then community legal services in East Palo Alto also met tests A and B in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. Um, yeah, and I think those are the only, aside from Law Foundation of Silicon Valley and Santa Clara, um, so two of them are presumed, the two I just mentioned are presumed eligible for the allocation because they met the quantitative test. Other, other questions from committee? Does anyone have, I don't know whether the person is still on the phone from San Mateo, but if so, we'd be happy to hear from them or if a committee member had questions from them, we'd be happy to let you ask them. Maybe they're not here. One person um, has their hand up. Angie, go ahead. Well, I, and, I just, Angie and Cynthia is also here, but go ahead. You go my, first, Angie. So my question was only that um, the judge is right that there were a lot of other uh, resources for pro bono, but they seem to be a more specialized area. And does the Silicon Valley group have some kind of unique niche or different service that's not being provided otherwise? They, they have a range of services. I mean, they mentioned a couple, but they're not limited to the two that were mentioned, I think. So oh, maybe Cynthia will be able to yeah. answer that. I, I thought the point was that when you're looking at their staff provided services, it's maybe not a fair comparison to say, that you should look at some kinds of services because they're, they're not services that can be provided by a pro bono. Um, one example was they do um, uh, mental health commitment work and that happens within a very short period of time as I understood it and you can't find a pro bono nor would they have the specialized potentially knowledge and training about is the person a danger to themselves or other those kind of things where that commitment hearing or a mental health, mental health hearing. So I think that was one of the distinctions they were making is that their service delivery does a portion of their cases do not lend themselves to pro bono so that the percentage of, of that comparison of volunteer hours to staff hours really is, is not a, it's a false comparison in some ways because they think you would need to exclude a particular, those services that you can, could not really use pro bono for. But we, we should let Cynthia better explain that than I might. Hi, hi everyone. Yes, that, that's exactly it. Um, the, the point that I was trying to make is that we have a total of 57 staff attorneys, paid staff attorneys, and 20 of those staff attorneys work with um, civil commitment hearings that were, were just described and then also represent children and youth in direct court appointments. Um, that work we've been doing for the last 10 years, I would say that that is representing the most, the vulnerable of the most vulnerable. Um, individuals, those cases range. Um, sometimes we can have clients who come to us um, at the infancy age, so they're a few months old. Um, and, you know, clients, you know, can, can vary in age, of course, but it, it's really, it's representing, um, you know, clients that we cannot refer elsewhere. Um, and I will just say that 
we've been we've been doing the work for the last 10 years and there was some intentionality about moving this work away from um, the, the public defender who I believe previously held the contract to our office because the thought I believe from the judicial council was that our office would be better positioned to provide holistic care and you know provide services on housing and public benefits and provide a wide range of services um, with, with respect to the need. And yes, again, the point I was making is reviewing the hours alone, you know, and, and comparing us to some of our sister organizations who approved so were approved solely on the hours um, puts us at a disadvantage because we, you know, a high volume of our work is direct court appointments, um, which, which does account for a significant amount of staff hours. Thank you for, for the explanation, Cynthia. Do, do other members of the committee have comments or, or questions that they want to raise about this agenda item or this grantee in particular? grantees request in particular. I'm not I'm not seeing any other questions or comments. And none in LA either, right? Okay. Um, maybe what we should do is uh, put up the um, proposed resolution, um, Erica, from staff, and then um, see if there's it, it, Get a sense of whether there's agreement or questions about that, um, and then um, and then we can proceed accordingly. <coughs> Sorry for all the back and forth with sharing. No, it's fine. Here we go. Um, it was a, it's a two-part resolution. So the first slide has the um, the proposed resolution for those recommended as eligible. And then the second slide has, has the resolution for those recommended as ineligible. Okay, and this is um, under any of the tests, right? Uh, for test C. Um, for test, test C. A, test A and B are presumed to be eligible. Okay. Um, sorry, I was misreading number six. So that makes sense. Um, so this has been updated to reflect staff's recommendation of Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino for San Bernardino County only, not Riverside, and to add Riverside um, legal aid. So why don't we take these up in kind of the, in the two groups? And is there any other discussion about the resolution to recommend uh, funding? Uh, pro bono allocation under test C for the 10 organizations that are listed on the slide. Any questions here? No. Any quite Erica, are there any other hands raised for this part of the resolution? Um, I don't see any. Okay, so if there's no other discussion about this, let's um, let's just vote on this half of the motion first. To do the roll call when you have a chance. Uh, I'm sorry, was there a motion? Oh, sorry, you're right. There was not. Motion. So, thank you, Judge Klein. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Okay, we have a second in LA for, you know, we got to get the LA people involved in uh, making and seconding motion. So, thank you. All right, now we can. Um, any other discussion, questions? Okay, now we can do roll call on that, that motion. Um, Akalagi? Fightmaster? Yes. King? Yes. Klein? Yes. Meeker? Yes, but recuse uh, on the issue of the Public Law Center in Orange County. Uh, Vargas? Yes. Kamara? Yes. Great. Uh, the motion carries. Okay. Thanks for that. And let's look at the second part of the motion. Too many windows. 
we're well ahead of the timeline. We've got plenty of time. So take your time to get it up on the screen. So um, this motion um, is uh, that the committee would recommend um, that uh, using the test C pro, pro bono um, tests that applicants are ineligible for the pro bono allocation. Um, it lists Law Foundation of Silicon Valley and Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino, but Riverside um, only. Um, so are there questions or discussion about this recommendation? Question for discussion in LA, none in LA. Any, any others have questions or discussion? Yeah, I do. Um, I'm going to have, I have to uh, abstain on Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. So I'm not sure how to answer this when the motion comes across. Just do it in a two in two pieces then abstain as to one and yes as to the other. Okay. That makes sense. It does. Yeah, okay. we can do that. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other comments or discussion about the motion? And it does not seem like there is any. Would someone like to make a motion? I'll move. Angie moves the motion. Is there a second? Second. Judge Klein. Okay. Let's. Any other discussion? Not seeing any. Um, and I think we understand that Louise will be abstaining from a portion of the, the motion. Um, so, do you want to uh, call roll? Sure. McCloggy? Fight Master? Abstain as to Law Foundation of Silicon Valley and yes as to the San Bernardino. Thank you. King? Yes. Klein? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Vargas? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you for that, um, Erica. Um, are there other eligibility uh, issues for us to discuss or eligibility review conference updates? Yeah, so no, um, no new eligibility issues. We had put that on there in case something um, came up while we've been reviewing, um, but fortunately we haven't had anything novel um, arise. So, um, so no updates on that at this time. Um, and then as far as eligibility review conferences, we are still um, in the process of scheduling with um, Coalition of California Welfare Rights Organizations. Um, we had a, a tentative date that unfortunately was not viable for everybody. So um, I appreciate all of you responding to the original doodle poll, but um, we're going to need to send out a couple more dates. Um, so I will, um, I'll send an updated one either today or Monday um, to, to get your availability. So I apologize for needing to do that again. And are there any other expected um, eligibility review conferences needed? Uh, no, we haven't identified any others. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, do people have any questions or updates about the updates? Okay, I think we're at the, is, are, are we actually at the end of our agenda? Yes, it uh, looks like Jim. Oh, Jim, sorry, I missed your hand up there in the corner. Yeah, uh, I think the next meeting is what, uh, August 10th? Yes. In the morning, and that's the same meeting they want all of us to show up at the commission meeting? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. So we'll be doing it in person, I guess, then? I think um, there's still option for people to do it remotely, depending on kind of travel, right? So yep. people, it, it can, it'll be a hybrid meeting like this, but there was an encouragement to um, be in person if people were able to do that. 
Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll attend it both in person because I come in on the train. So <laughs> that hour window between the two is just not long enough to get there by train. Oh yeah, and it's no problem to, we just as you know, you see folks in the LA conference room today, we'll make it available for you um, for the morning meeting as well. So. Okay. okay. Any Any other questions? If not, I think we are adjourned. I never actually remember if we need a motion for that. So no. do not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone for participating. Okay. Um, thanks to the staff for all the really helpful materials. Um, and we will, I think several of us, we, we have a lot of meetings coming up on different <laughs> subjects. So we will, I'm sure be in touch uh, early next month. Happy Bastille Day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye.